This is a great presentation that Bird has put together um, about starts out with as fabric structures, but really leads quickly into ETFE structures. Um, so let's go through and review this. This was a um, this is the uh, pre slides because of uh, it being an AIA presentation. Um, a little disclaimer, a lot of the ideas of the learning objectives have a, a little bit of a marketing bent to them, but really not so strong. Um, we should all be aware that this idea of fabric structures is not new. They've been around as long as we've been building. And Berdair, which is a, has a Buffalo affiliation, Walter Bird started doing work with Cornell Aeronautical Labs. They had a research facility by the Buffalo Airport. And probably one of their early contracts, um, without digging too much into the uh, research, was to make these radar domes. These are domes that cover um, uh, uh, radar um, antennas needed to be protected from the wind and the elements in order to stay accurate and um, in, in storm events. And so um, the technologies that they developed uh, with that allowed them to enter the architectural world. They're not the only ones. There are many people building these kind of tensile structures around the world. Um, as you can see, 1967 uh, Expo. Um, so, um, but it's also uh, important to note, uh, while you don't see a lot of these structures, they're extremely um, long-term lasting, which might kind of uh, be a little um, of a surprise to people who haven't dealt with fabric structures. These are fiberglass, um, high-performance structures, or roof systems uh, with Teflon coatings to them. They're not cheap, uh, but they perform very well, many decades, and uh, can be uh, comparable to uh, just about any other kind of constructed roofing system. In Buffalo, uh, Walter Bird um, even covered his swimming pool with some of these early concepts. So this is from 1957 to give you a little historical perspective on it. And like um, like every uh, high performance material, we always like to have that connection to uh, NASA and uh, high performance um, uh, materials. And a lot of the development work of these kind of uh, materials would come out of the space program. So. Um, uh, inflated structures, these are structures that have no steel systems. They are held up by air, quite popular. We've had um, some huge failures with them where they've lost their air support or been collapsed under extreme snow loads. And um, in recent years, I've seen a very few of these proposed. But nonetheless, this is a methodology of creating a, a large dome system with a very little bit of structural steel. And these may come into popularity again um, when we talk about trying to be more environmental, less structure. Um, early uh, use of, of films for um, glazing systems. And then some contemporary um, um, uses of it, um, the ETFE films. So none of this is, is new, even though we may not be all that familiar with it. Um, here's the, I guess, the first um, like intellectual breaking point or, or branching of how we think about creating these uh, structures and what the advantages of them might be. Uh, we've already started to look at creating glazed systems where we're supporting glass panels with structural components and dealt with some of the ideas of glass as a flat surface, it's planar. When we get to curvilinear surfaces, they have very little ability to manipulate the geometry without adding a lot of complexity. Um, and then when we move to ETFE structures, you can see there's a greatly uh, reduced amount of steel and um, uh, flexibility in, uh, in the way that we build our roofing systems. So obviously we, we um, we get a lot of advantages. And they term it as high cost and cost efficient. Cost efficient means you're probably paying an extraordinarily large amount of money for some of the other things that go around with the connection systems and the films themselves. But by being cost efficient, they're referring to the reduction in metal and structural elements that go along with it. And then this is a brief kind of discussion about loading systems. This has a couple of, you know, a deflection of a, a you can imagine a piece of glass. And in this case, we can start to look at these plastic systems, um, which have no weight to, of them, their own. And when they are um, inflated, they create their own kind of structural support um, by just like uh, an inner tube would be able to, or any kind of uh, air inflated structure, would be able to create its own kind of support system. And this is the start of the introduction to 
um, the structural systems also. So we're clamping these pillows down. We have um, um, some way of separating them from the main structure. And um, we'll get into a little more of that in some more close-up details. So um, the idea here is that we do, when we have these uh, air-supported structures, we have no loads that we need to support. We get spans of 8 to 16 feet. And so there's a lot of advantages. So here we have a glaze system. And we can see that we triangulated the panels because they're flat and planar. And we have a whole lot of componentry. And then when we go to um, an ETFE, we have um, now just major bent elements. These cross are probably stabilizing elements, and I don't think they look quite attractive in the way they've been applied. And then we have the uh, standoff from the structure, and then the ETFE film on that. So um, really a great, even though these two are not compelling comparisons here, a great simplification in the amount of structural componentry that has to go along with it. Um, I just want to keep moving through a lot of these. You can take the time to uh, read through this. I don't want to make my presentation too tedious. One of them here, uh, one of the uh, important things to note here is kind of the relationship between the vendor, the, the, the person who produces this material, and the actual uh, flow in the, in the construction of a, of a building with its applications. In this case, a lot of times we talk about this idea of design assist. You meet with the vendor very early in the project, say you're going to use their material, um, and then you work in collaboration to def determine a whole host of fa uh, factors around its design and fabrication and its modeling, feasibility studies, and all of that. And um, many times these firms are the, also the installers of the systems. And just another reiteration of that idea of the design and build process. Um, this is just a close-up of the attachment systems, capping strip probably applied in this direction. There are no capping strips in these directions either. Um, but we'll see in a cross-section how these uh, films are attached. Um, one of the things I'm trying to point out here is here we have this uh, aluminum rail, which is our clamping system for a film, and we have our underlying steel structure. One of, the, um, one of the advantages in this kind of a lightweight system is that this track can be mounted with adjustable, and you can see the little slotted adjustments to stand off from the main primary structure here. So there is a bit of a, um, a simplifying of the amount of precision required in the fit up. Um, but you know, here, here's a little um, indication of, of errors in fit up. Um, calculations and then kind of the way of field um, addressing those uh, when the tolerances aren't met. Um, they talk about providing um, el finite element analysis and all kinds of structural uh, detailings about this, probably from their proprietary software. Uh, but we can also see here that this is a lot of this we can model um, in inside of Revit now, um, at least to start to create the preliminary components of, of our design. And here we have it with now the fabric or the, the um, membrane applied to it. A little look inside of the factory of this. So here you're actually seeing an uninflated piece of the film material on a large table. The, the, um, obviously the floor area required for laying out and welding and creating these membranes um, is uh, large. And this is probably a, uh, I believe this either could be a welding machine uh, by uh, passing a laser over the surface and welding the two edges together or ultrasonically, or it could be a cutting machine, and I, I, I'm not exactly sure here. Um, uh, this, they're talking about cutting patterns, so this is probably a cutting machine. And this is probably then a welding, an ultrasonic or a laser welding machine, or heat and pressure, well, radio frequency, so that's an ultrasonic type of, of um, bonding of the two halves of the pillow together. And here we have them laying it out on the floor. And here's another detail of that um, aluminum um, um, attachment component. It looks like they have a place to try and collect what might be condensation that might come off of the films so it doesn't drip um, from high in the structure. We have, it uh, looks like some um, some um, wire rope going through here. This may be used for 
climbing and safety attachment uh, for people who have to service um, the, um, the panel system. And here we have them installing these large panels. So in this case, these are very long linear panels between two clamping systems. And this is the, you know, this one looks like it's been applied and inflated. This one appears to not have been inflated yet. And then this one isn't even um, unfurled. So it's been attached at one side, it's been rolled up, and it will be unrolled and then clamped down on the other side as we go through its installation. So we have a lot of ability to change um, the way this material um, performs and looks. We can control the number of layers on it. We can, we can um, add colorants to it and or print on it. Uh, the technical aspect of this material, um, ethylene, tetrafluoroethylene, ETFE. Um, I can never say that properly. Um, obviously, um, the, the, the important idea here is that it is in the family of Teflon, so it has um, many material properties that are very um, advantageous to uh, high performance, um, UV resistance, transparency, um, and longevity. And they also talk about this being recyclable, which is I find kind of interesting, but um, we'll take their word for it talks about this is just the manufacturer of it. They can control the size and thickness of the film. Important for us as architects is the transparency um, in a very high range of transparency. So that can be considered a, a excellent and or problematic. Um, obviously letting a lot of uh, UVA um, for the promotion of photosynthesis in plants. So we're talking about greenhouses. It reduces uh, UVC which is um, that the damage um, skin for uh, skin cancer. Um, and so, you know, these properties, an important part of the evaluation and um, part of what we would use when we're comparing using glass systems with it. Another, um, uh, you know, super property of these films is their elasticity. So here we have um, this idea of a plastic region. And um, here we have um, a um, a tensile testing machine where we're stretching these this element out so it starts out um, a sample is cut that large and then it is pulled apart um, until it breaks so you can see this huge amount of elongation before the system fails and we can compare that to the brittleness I guess of what you might think of as, as plate glass. Um, another surprising um, performance is that it, it's, it has good fire resistance. So we're, we're seeing these things um, melting through. Um, I say fire resistance, that's um, uh, maybe a little bit uh, misleading. These, um, they don't create a, f a fuel source um, to uh, promote more fire, but they will melt through, obviously. That's what we're seeing here. Um, and then, you know, obviously there's this idea of a long-term performance of these. They've been well tested now, so we, you know, as a, as a, as an application, we can be pretty well um, uh, comfortable about its performance. So here we have it in a, in a four-way tensile testing machine. Um, you know, the kind of, you know, this is just more showing you how well tested the systems are. You know, outdoor weathering racks where they look at the films and deterioration over years. Um, accelerated wear where they um, change the room temperature frequently to um, a, a regime of hot, cold, and freezing weather. Um, we have many ways, because we have a good high tensile um, performance of this material, um, we can use this um, material in a variety of ways. One is that we've already really talked about, that idea of making cushions out of it. The only way you can really see that these are cushion shapes is probably to see this kind of um, uh, bent piece of plywood here because of the transparency of the material. But over here we have um, a, a welded up um, film that's supported up on a top ring and a bottom ring. These may be embedded cable systems. I'm not exactly sure what's going on here, but uh, it's just one single layer. So there's, there's no insulating performance. There's no air inflated pillows here. It's just designed to uh, prevent water and or in this case, it looks like it might be used as a water collection system. And surprisingly, um, they really have a great um, amount of ability to carry load. 
So here we have a, an, an inflated um, st structure, a, a stadium roof, um, obviously indicating the size of the people, and this incredible amount of um, snow load. Of course, in order to make this perform, they need an air inflation system to keep them uh, inflated. Um, we'll talk about thermally insulating, uh, but this graphic probably is just the most important thing is this idea of being able to carry the loads. So one of the big issues that would come up um, with any kind of like uh, large glazing systems are both how much light does it transmit through, how much can it uh, prevent. We don't want to overheat our spaces. Many times are in many climates we're actually trying to prevent solar heat gain um, to reduce indoor temperatures. So uh, how, do we, how do we mitigate that with these trans, translucent films? while we still want to provide daylight and the advantages of these lightweight films. And then the other idea is this U-value, how well of an insulator is this? And we're talking about U-values as opposed to R-values because we're mostly thinking about these as glazing systems. So their performance is the complete system um, as a single unit. So, um, so there's some ways to actually improve the thermal performance. Just like with glazing systems, you can have a single glazing system or you could have a double glazing system. And so we have a middle layer in the film system and that allows us to um, basically double our insulating performance. And then in order to control um, solar heat gain, we can actually print on the material. We can make it reflective. And then we can control by the density of the dots, the shapes, how we print on it, control the amount of light that passes through our, our system. So here we have an example of um, creating some uh, shading with our, with our film system. And that was probably set up in a parking lot in Buffalo, New York some time ago. Obviously, this color and light thing, but um, you know that's um, there's many ways to introduce color into our architecture, which is not just in the colors of the film, but in the way we project light on them at night. Um, one of the big concerns about this system: it's an active system; it has to have air blown into it to keep the the system inflated. So we have to have a supply of air. So here we have a uh, distribution system with a, a, in a manifold type configuration where we have tubes coming off to inflate the pillows and these devices have to uh, perform a couple of functions. They have to remove the moisture so we don't get con condensation in the air that we supply. We have to remove the moisture should I say so that we don't get condensation within the pillows. Um, they have to have uh, backup power systems to them um, and they have to have some kind of a feedback loop to know how much pressure to put in according to the kinds of load they may have to resist. So here we have this kind of uh, set of exterior sensor, how much wind is coming on it, how much snow is on the film, um, things that would cause our system to actively want to respond to create better uh, structural and performance characteristics. Uh, this I've, I've kind of laid out before, but the idea is that we can create an interference pattern between the interior um, interior membrane and the exterior membrane by the way we inflate um, um, an inner layer film. So in this case, um, in this direction, there's a lot of openings. We inflate it on the other side and there is very little. So we could use this to uh, work as a kind of a blind system, specifically by how we print and then how we um, in use uh, inflate the uh, systems. This is a single skin application, no insulating performance, obviously. Um, it doesn't carry a heavy load on its own now because we don't have that idea of the inflated structure. Um, so this is a um, kind of an, an animal onto its own. A lot of the times what we've been thinking about with DTFEs in these kind of configurations, the ability to support that weight um, is not there. Um, but uh, once again, these still lots of applications. And then surprisingly, some, some buildings constructed with those kind of single layer uh, systems. So um, obviously the Beijing Stadium, um, you don't see that kind of a pillowing effect in the um, covering systems, um, uh, an important architectural um, issue.
just kind of a marketing on on the advantages of these materials to um, uh, deal with um, exterior fen fenestration um, for lighting systems the way they can create a translucent lighting um, and um, you know the, the the big one here is obviously how much heat can we retain and we're covering areas for two purposes one is to make them thermally comfortable and uh, protect us from elements so um, we want to know how well they can protect um, as far as losing heat so th this once again is a little bit of a marketing because we now jumped into a much more complicated graphic here we now have a, a an aerogel which is a translucent insulation um, between the materials in order to create insulation um, and we're comparing that to conventional roofs but this would be a very complicated and expensive at least at this point um, kind of installation but here we go and we talk a little bit about this idea of using aerogel uh, thermal installations and this is a moving target aerogels are getting um, much more common and advanced also uh, the idea of an, an aerogel is um, without having another graphic here is imagine a, a gel which is like a jello um, but extremely lightweight and instead of you know, you know that jello has that kind of transparency to it now we have a lot of interstitial airspace between it. It's extremely lightweight um, and works as an insulation while still providing uh, light transmittance. Um, now we're really getting into kind of details, more than we need to really concern ourselves with at this point, but the idea of thermal breaking. So we have two different, we have doubled up um, membrane systems and we have an insulator between those two just to um, to disrupt the conduction of heat through the metal substructure. This is a great example of special printing on the films with colored inks and then it played out in an application. Um, this gives you an idea of their load bearing capabilities um, but in this case we have PV films attached to the underside of the or the inside layer of the second film. So we have a clear covering to protect these and um, now we get uh, power output from them. So we have all of this this constellation of potential advantages to this material. Um, you know one of them um, is I, that I think we're going to um, experience in our project will be its extreme lightweightness, uh, light, lightweight performance of the material and the translucency um, along with that. And so that's, a, that's their overview of ETFE.